Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's streaming only History is Lunch program. We are again working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. I want to remind everyone that despite our temporary shift to this streaming only format for History's Lunch, our museums are open and so is our excellent special exhibit Mississippi Distilled which looks at prohibition in Mississippi, commonly known as the wettest dry state. Next week's History is Lunch program is in conjunction with that exhibit and will feature Josh Green discussing the infamous Jackson Country Club raid of 1966. Be sure to tune in for that. You know, streaming these has not gone badly. One thing I do miss is the groans from the audience <laughs> when you announce something like Josh's proposed title Acts and ye shall receive. <laughs> Today, we are delighted to welcome back our friend Deanne Stevens. Stevens earned her BS, MS, and PhD from the University of Southern Mississippi, where she is a professor of history and faculty member with the Center for the Study of the Gulf South. In 2009, the University Press of Alabama published her book, Scourge Among the Magnolias, the 1878 Yellow Fever Epidemic in Mississippi. Stevens was kind enough to present a History is Lunch program on the subject then, but we lacked the ability to capture those programs on video, and in light of the current pandemic, it seemed like the perfect moment to revisit the subject. Here is Deanne Stevens. Thank you, Chris. I am so honored to be here. Thank you all who are tuning in. Um, this is quite a timely presentation. Uh, so we're going to be looking today at the 78 epidemic and what I thought I would concentrate for this particular was yes to give the background but also looking at some of the losses not just in life but in uh, the um, monies that occurred when you look at an epidemic. So we're going to start out, uh, let me go ahead and give some background. I'd like to first start with a little bit of the history of yellow fever in Mississippi. We'll then go into the etiology of it, otherwise its symptoms, how you contract it. And then we'll kind of briefly look at Mississippi in 1878, that what was happening within the state that this particular epidemic would have been so impactful. So for the history of yellow fever, uh, most historians agree, and I would say probably all historians agree, that the yellow fever virus was carried in the holds of trade ships and enslaved ships. It is a endemic to Africa. It's a virus that lives, and there's a couple of types of yellow fever. Yellow fever is still a scourge in the world today. Uh, in fact, WHO gives out millions of inoculations, and inoculation and vaccine finally came around after World War II. So, you know, some of this is very germane to our conversations today with COVID. So there is an inoculation. Uh, anyone who's been in the military or has traveled probably has had that shot, that vaccination. So it, it started with perhaps any way a virus is introduced into human populations. That we don't know. It's that old age question, the chicken or the egg. But once it was introduced into human populations, and once the virus then caught rides everywhere, and when a person was infected with the virus, we referred to them as being viremic. So if you were a viremic person and you are on board a 1590-1610 ship coming over to the New World, you're going to trade, you're going to get off, you as that person would have introduced then the virus into the New World. So, and it's, it's interesting with yellow fever and any virus, the organism or the virus has to have a particular niche. It has its own, its own world, if I can say, that it lives in. So with yellow fever, and I'm moving into the um, uh, symptoms and uh, the causes of it, but with yellow fever, it has to be for the urban yellow fever. It has to be a mosquito vector that carries it. And what that means is that if you were a viremic individual, you had the virus, just like we see with COVID today, you could have carried yellow fever virus and really never knew that you had yellow fever. 
or we'll talk about what could have happened opposite to that. So the mosquito that in the New World, and she's still around, is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So this Aedes aegypti mosquito that we can find New Orleans, we can find in the coast, we can find wherever, she is the carrier, and I'm saying she because it is the female who must take the blood meal in order to make eggs to um, propagate. So if a mosquito were to bite someone in Mississippi in 1878, and that person happened to be a carrier of yellow fever, she's very specific in the fact that the viremic individual is um, really only able at the peak within three to four days after that person has contracted yellow fever. So what I'm trying to say is that the mosquito could bite a viremic individual, you know, over a period of two weeks, but it's the critical point when that person is carrying the virus in two to three days that she bites. And that is when you had, as a viremic individual, peak amount of virus. She then was able to take the blood meal. She picks it up through her blood meal, and then it goes through her system. And it took about maybe a week to two weeks for her then to then, when she bit another person, to transport it into that person via her bite. So it's a very specialized, and it seems that um, there were so many people who contracted yellow fever that just with that specialization that it would have been prohibitive in keeping the numbers down, but not so. So once the mosquito, we'll say, inoculated the person with the yellow fever virus, she had to have picked it up, remember, from someone viremic. Once that occurs, the virus then enters the person's body. It is in the bloodstream. The virus attacks red blood cells. And the virus can attack red blood cells, and it goes in, and the virus then can kind of, I guess for lack of, I'm not a scientist, we'll just say wheedle its way on into the red blood cells. And there it begins replicating which means it begins producing itself, and ultimately then by doing that, it's going to burst those red blood cells. Yellow fever symptoms are going to sound a little familiar in today's world. High fever, aches and pains, flu-like symptoms in the beginning. And that is when the virus is just has been introduced and is getting started in the body. Many people went beyond that. They experienced backache, long bones hurt, your legs, your arms, you had a terrific headache, uh, maybe some chills. And many people then just simply carried on, got healthy, never even know they had yellow fever. In some individuals, however, yellow fever then continued to ravage their body and it attacked the internal organs. It is often called yellow fever. There's all kinds of names for it. The yellow plume of death, the black scourge, the black vomit, bronze john. There's many ways, saffron scourge, you can see written sometimes in old documents. But the reason you hear yellow so associated with yellow fever is because it does begin attacking internal organs and of course individuals who are now experiencing a much more severe case become jaundiced and take on a yellow appearance, yellow eyes, yellow appearance to the skin. So thus yellow fever because it is attacking internal organs. Probably one of the most nasty characteristics of yellow fever, remember we, we said that it attacks red blood corpuscles. So once it begins that and the person begins hemorrhaging, oftentimes the hemorrhaging within the stomach, the esophagus and things, uh, resulted in what was the horrible symptom, black vomit. And that simply was your own body, because you're hemorrhaging inside, 
um, I guess we could say it would be very much like a very, very bad ulcer symptom, but your own body then was, and it's, it's a little nasty, was actually working on your own blood, and then the vomiting occurred. And doctors generally, through the 1878 epidemic and earlier, acknowledged the fact that when a poor victim experienced black vomit, death was imminent. Your, 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 your insides had been attacked. Today we know renal failure, heart failure, and internal um, infection often killed people with yellow fever. So I'm gone into so much detail with the symptoms for this reason. In 1878, when yellow fever was mentioned, it put the fear of God in the people. They knew the outward horrible symptoms. They, of course, did not know, medical knowledge did not have that ability, that many people had recovered from yellow fever. They had those flu-like symptoms and they didn't know it. But the association in 1878 with the very terrible, terrible, high, high fever, the black vomit, the shakes, the pain that people went through, uh, that is their perception in 1878 of what yellow fever was like. So a very fearful disease. Mississippi in 1878 then, we, we, we need to remind ourselves that Mississippi in 1878 had just gone through many political turmoils. Uh, after the um, American Civil War, there was much um, uh, stress, would be a way to say it, going on in settling governments within the state. Uh, race relations were at an all-time low. We know from our history Republicans uh, ascended, and the, the government itself uh, was almost, I like to think of it as a two-fold government. There was an undercurrent government of Democrats, and then there were the Republicans who were in power. The Republicans in power, and we don't, that's not the topic of this one, that's I'm sure another history is lunch, but the Republicans in power recognized the fact that there was no health system in the state of Mississippi. Louisiana in the 1850s had actually established the state, the first state board of um, health. Mississippi had the exact same scenarios as Louisiana. We shared the Mississippi River, and I'll talk about its significance in just a moment. So there was really no difference in epidemics and diseases from our neighboring state of Louisiana, but Mississippi simply did not have a state board of health. And with the political turmoil that was going on, particularly as we moved into the early 1870s, I'm sure many of you have uh, researched the Meridian Race Riots, the, the voting problems that were going on, and you know African Americans attempting to vote and attempting to become a part of the political system and the social system and the economic system, those problems associated with that. Well, here we're coming in 1878 with an epidemic. And reminder, just three years before that, in 1875, the Mississippi Plan had decided how the Democrats were going to return to power and the Republican government would become, you know, defunct. So in 1875, with the Mississippi Plan, there were terrorist tactics used in voting that was coming in 1876. There were actually, in one community, cannons set up to keep voters from coming in. People were denied the right to vote. So in 1876, what we find is that the Democratic government was overthrown. And I'm just two years away from this epidemic. So by 1877, Adelbert Ames has been removed as governor of Mississippi, and a new Democratic governor is in, and that would be John Marshall Stone from Iuka. Uh, 
And we find that many of the new Democratic, and not really new, but new to the seat at that time, uh, were ex-Confederate soldiers or officers. They were certainly of the ilk of a patriarchal power that was returning uh, to power in Mississippi. And this is who we have in 1876-1877. So since the Civil War, with the horrific death toll of that, until this time, Mississippi knew it needed something health-wise, but it had not been able to accomplish that. Under John Stone, in 1877, the Mississippi State Board of Health was created. That exact same year, the law that enacted that also gave power to every county in the state to enact a county board of health. And remember, Mississippi has been in a state of turmoil, so we know that with each county board of health, obviously some ran better than others, some were more effective in measures during the epidemic than others, and some were just almost non-existent. Now, what did the Mississippi State Board of Health, what was its um, mandate in 1878? Basically, it was an advisory board. It was, um, it was charged with suggesting, Wirt Johnson is the secretary during the 1878 epidemic, he could suggest things that communities could do through the county court, you know, I mean, through the county boards of health. They had no money. Mississippi has had turbulent economic times, as we know, coming into this. So there's no money to enforce this. So the Mississippi State Board of Health in 1878 basically became an advisory board. Wirt Johnson did an exemplary job of getting the word out, handwriting letters to doctors and through the county boards. This is what, you know, we should do. He never, however, could say this is what you must do. It was always a suggestion. He also was very quick to suggest that statistics be kept. So as a researcher, and those of you who might want to pursue this, there's wonderful numbers that came about where he asked for doctors to report cases and things. So in 1878, we've had turbulent political times, economic hardships, a brand new state board of health that has really no teeth to it. And here comes the worst epidemic in history. So let's get to this next one. So in Mississippi, um, the origin of yellow fever is oftentimes very closely tied to New Orleans. New Orleans was a point, um, a port here, and if we travel the Mississippi River down here, New Orleans is about right down here. But for generations, um, New Orleans and the bookend city of Mobile with the coast sandwiched in between here, this coast had developed lake trade, it had developed um, a tourist industry, many of the coastal towns, I'll mention Pass Christian, Bay St. Louis, were almost like bedroom communities of New Orleans. Um, the river was the connective artery of travel uh, it went down to New Orleans. Much of our uh, produce, much of our lumber, our cotton that was being produced would all come down this river to the various ports. We had all kinds of little ports along the river. Uh, it would come down, go to New Orleans, and from there then it would be factored out and shipped to wherever it was going. And then the people in Mississippi would receive money through the cotton factors that were in the city of New Orleans if they were cotton plantation owners. So, Wirt Johnson, as that first secretary of this brand new board, he realized this and he heard in early 1878, because newspapers, and there's all kinds of wonderful primary newspapers that you can research, that a ship named the Emily Souter had come into New Orleans. Now, this is significant. It had come to, into New Orleans from Havana, Cuba. It was well known that Cuba, in fact, D'Iberville himself had died in Cuba of yellow fever. Cuba was a hotbed of yellow fever. Well, of course, we understand that now. 
You've got viremic individuals. You've got Aedes aegypti's mosquitoes who love to lay her eggs in uh, stagnant water, swampy areas. So it was just a perpetuation. The suitor came into New Orleans, and because of the horrific characteristics of yellow fever, people were very, very cautious if they even wanted to mention yellow fever was on board ships or yellow fever, uh, a person had died of yellow fever within the city. But the suitor came in from Havana and on board when she docked in uh, New Orleans, there were already dead individuals. And you had the telltale bruising, you had the uh, vomit, you already knew that there was yellow fever. Well, that was New Orleans. So Wirt Johnson sends out word, well, there, there, there's an outbreak in New Orleans. We, we need to be vigilant. And this is when he sends out tracts of information to physicians and county boards of health. You know, this is what you should do. This is how you should handle it. I would like this, these numbers of cases, this, this, and this. And the only tool he could offer for combating yellow fever was quarantine. Quarantine had been around in Mississippi um, as legislative laws throughout the 19th century to quarantine against other diseases, not just yellow fever. And they believed, they didn't understand the, the life cycle of yellow fever, that it was the mosquitoes that are bringing it in, but they had other theories of transmission about yellow fever, and one of them was that it was a miasmic bad air. So scientists figured out that many people who lived near water oftentimes got sick. Well, we know it's the mosquitoes that they were slapping at night. We also know that by 1878, there's a fomite theory of contagion, that there actually were particles that a person could touch and become infected. And then, of course, there was another theory that it was just perhaps the way you lived your life. So there's, there's no way that you can put your finger on how you were going to get yellow fever. So if we think about that, word comes to Mississippi in June that there's yellow fever in New Orleans. We know the horrific characteristics of the disease. We don't know how we can catch it. We don't know who's going to catch it. It crossed all bounds, socioeconomic bounds, just the fear that people lived in. And I also need to mention here that yellow fever was almost an annual occurrence in the state of Mississippi. Just to what degree that was going to occur was always the scare. So the disease had been around for since the Spanish landed. We talked about the trade ships. And we knew it was every year just how bad. The 53 epidemic, 1853 epidemic, had at that point in history been the high water mark for Louisiana and the South. Uh, and Mississippi. You can still find uh, remnants of graves throughout Mississippi from 53, uh, but no one knew what was coming for 78. So regardless of the fact that New Orleans is in um, a state of yellow fever announcement, the John Porter boat, it was a boat, a tugboat, came out of New Orleans and began coming up the Mississippi River conducting business. And it landed in Vicksburg. By the time it gets to Vicksburg and it goes on up, and it was supposed to come on up and go way up on into the Ohio River system, um, there were already cases of yellow fever on board. You can only imagine down by the docks in New Orleans, people were in close proximity to one another. Mosquitoes were abundant. It's now July in Mississippi and New Orleans. And this is generally the um, accepted point where yellow fever came into Mississippi. Uh, by the time the John Porter completed its round and came back, literally a newspaper called it a floating charnel house. It was, and those people who were, uh, take, were taken off of the ship, uh, many communities did not want the dead off of the ship because of yellow fever, but you still had the mosquitoes. You still had the mosquitoes and you had the viremic individuals. 
Uh, 80s Egypti loved water containers on boats. She loved bilge water. She could be perfectly happy living on board a ship and be carried up and down the Mississippi River and continuously then rebreeding, if I can say that. Railroad lines in Mississippi also, and this is a modern map, ladies and gentlemen, but the roads pretty much follow the old railroad lines. After the Civil War, railroad construction in the 1870s had somewhat of a boom. Brad Bond has a good book that covers that. Uh, we come out across, this was a railroad line, the little town of Lake, Jackson, Vicksburg. This was also an existing railroad line that came up here, basically the same. And then we had little offshoots over here that came and Meridian and Grenada were a very big railroad town. Then on the coast, in the, by the 1870s, I-10, we also had a rail line that connected those bookend cities for trade purposes of New Orleans and Mobile. So we had good railroad lines. We had this. And this is what happens when yellow fever appears in Mississippi in July as a result of the John Porter landing. Panic. Absolute panic. People get on these railroad lines. They get on boats coming out of the state. They want to get out. They want to find a refuge in the country. They get on little tiny railroad spur lines that have been built for trade purposes. And what they don't know, they themselves could have been viremic or 80s Egypti also could be hitching a ride. And a mosquito could be on your clothing. You get on board the train. And that mosquito then is now introduced into a new population. So mass panic occurs around the state of Mississippi. J.L. Power with the Masons really has a wonderful compilation that I used extensively and I know other researchers have. He and Wirt Johnson, but Powers created also a statistical collection point through the Masons. And he talked about even every penny that was spent and every person that contracted. And from that source, many wonderful stories occur as a result of that. Um, just to name one story, and there's so many poignant stories, up here in the area, Water Valley is not in, but I guess it'd be over in this area, Water Valley, Mississippi, a um, couple, an older couple by the name of Buford, she had property down on the coast in what is present-day Gulf Hills area. She, which is kind of remarkable, she had gone down to check on things. There supposedly was some issues, and her husband remained in Water Valley. They had a series of letters that went back and forth that almost opens up and foretells and portends the tragedy that is coming. You know, they're wonderful love letters between a husband and wife who have been married for a long time. My darling, be safe. Are you putting camp for in your shoes? She writes back, yes, I am. However, we're sitting out on the porch and the mosquitoes are terrible. And she talks about them. People would burn things, um, smudge pot kind of things. They had all kinds of ideas about um, keeping the mosquitoes away, but they didn't realize in keeping the mosquitoes at bay, they were also keeping yellow fever away. It's a very poignant story. She contracts yellow fever, and the letters stop. And that's one Mississippian story about that disease that happened. There are so many. Um, we find that as the disease progressed from July with the John Porter through, the State Board of Health had no ability to help. There were no drugs that could be offered. And what kind of drugs are we talking about? Well, if we're talking about the old allopathic kind of treatments, we're talking about arsenic kinds of compounds, we're talking about very harsh drugs. If we're talking about a homeopathic kind of a treatment that existed in Mississippi at this time, Vicksburg had quite a, I think about eight doctors, there was a father-son Hardenstein, Dr. Hardenstein's that were homeopathic. You were treated much more mildly 
Um, there were still some treatments where they believed um, purging and body plasters and things and covering you with blankets. Uh, there was uh, the treatment array. There were the Thompsonians that who believed in herbal teas and things. It depended upon where you lived as to how you were going to be treated. The most vexing problem for physicians was the fever. They thought that if they could control the fever, they could control the disease. But they, they were operating in the dark. There's just nothing that they could do. Uh, what did come out of the yellow fever epidemic, though, was the significance of nursing. If a person could have good nursing, it seemed that that person would do better. Because Mississippi could not take care of its own through this turbulent time and political upheaval and this new government and this new State Board of Health, we find that local charities, local churches became very important. An association that had been created by John Howard uh, earlier in the century specifically for New Orleans yellow fever, it simply referred to as the Howards. It was absolutely indispensable in Mississippi, and even local Howard associations rose in cities across the uh, state. So you had people collecting money. Within Mississippi, Mississippi through 1878 received $522,632.42, according to J.L. Power, in total relief, and that would be from across the country. There was even some French citizens who contributed to the plight of the poor people in Mississippi who were suffering from yellow fever. The United States government brought in supplies and monies. Um, about 150,000 of provisional aids came down at the probably around October, November of the epidemic on the John Porter. Unfortunately, the captain of that ship got off in Vicksburg, contracted yellow fever. So the federal government was reaching out to help the state. Local charities, you had up in Holly Springs, you had a very poignant story of Sisters of Charity um, who died, all of them, including the priest who were tending, and you can go see that in Holly Springs today, uh, the tribute to those. You had people across the state who decided to stay behind. I will mention it's not in Mississippi, but um, Jefferson Davis's son decided to stay in Memphis and keep a bank open, of which his brother-in-law and he worked, because people needed cash, because quarantine lines prohibited everything, and of course he contracted yellow fever in doing so. So many people decided to help in many different ways, but again, the state board absolutely had its hands tied and could not help. There just simply was no way that it could. Quarantine lines cut off trade. One particularly um, woman who received some of the money, she was out of Osaka, Mississippi, and I'm quoting, she said, what you gave me was the only money I had this summer. And that would have been money coming in as a donation. And even if they had a place to spend the money, oftentimes stores, the lines of the railroad that um, we had here coming along, the railroad lines oftentimes had shut down. And the railroad itself in 1878, from August 1 to November 1, recorded uh, the total rail loss was about 311000 that they lost in revenue. Now, some railroads carried people free of charge trying to get out of yellow fever. So I think what we find, and I'm trying to convey, is that the populace during this epidemic, it was a panic situation. Where do you go to be safe? Husbands and wives were dying and leaving children behind. You had to have orphans that had to be taken care of, and then churches and papal were opening up homes and promising in poignant letters to take care of my, my best friend's daughter. It, it was just 
a terrible, terrible situation. And when we're talking about this, what kind of numbers are we talking about? So I can tell you that in 1878, Mississippi had almost a 26% death rate. So out of 100 people who caught yellow fever after being bit by a mosquito, the 80s Egypti carrying that yellow fever virus, we were going to lose 20, almost 26 people out of that. Let me just give you some figures. I thought Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee, because those were the three hardest hit. Um, there's been excellent work done by Joanne Kerrigan um, about the Louisiana yellow fever epidemic for the whole, from the beginning of colonial times to the end of yellow fever in the states in 1905. And Tennessee has many books in Memphis. Khalid Bloom did a great book about the great epidemic too. So there's lots of research that you could do if you were interested. But Louisiana in 1878 recorded 24,000, I'm approximate, you know, rounding off, cases of yellow fever. About 5,000 people died, which was about a 20.3% death rate. Tennessee recorded, particularly in Memphis, about 14,000. There was about 3,500 who died. That's about a 25% death rate. Mississippi recorded about 13,000. About 3,200 died. That was a 25.7, almost 26% death rate. You will find that those numbers vary, however. And the reason those numbers vary, even though Wirt Johnson and J.L. Power is asking for statistics, how many caught yellow fever, how many people died, the numbers don't always match up. Record keeping was crude at best, and we had people in Mississippi who were marginalized and who would not have been counted in the death rate or the caseload. And let me give you an example. Let me please go back up to Holly Springs. Let me see if I can. I'm up here in Holly Springs. Living in Holly Springs at the time was a young lady named Ida Barnett. And Ida Barnett uh, was an African-American young woman. As soon as emancipation had come to Holly Springs, her family, I only know her father's name at this point, Jim, her mom and father had gone and married at the courthouse. He had become involved in local politics. And she had, and her particularly Ida as the oldest child, had been um, educated and could read and write. And her younger siblings were also going to school in the freedom schools that were occurring. So as Mississippi then went through the transformation, of the Freedom Schools and the Freedmen's Bureau and everything that was going on and the new 1876-1877 election, those doors often closed. And Ida, as a 16-year-old young woman, had gone and was working with her grandmother when the epidemic started. Now, when she heard that her family in Holly Springs and you can certainly still go see her house, there's a wonderful museum there, uh, had yellow fever. She, of course, uh, was to help with the family, that philanthropic familial duty, and to do the best because to whom would she have turned as a young African-American woman in Mississippi in 1878. She helps with her family. Her mother and father both die. When you look at Power's book, it's listed as Jim Barnett, Negro, as a death, then wife of, died. So these, that record in itself is significant for two reasons. That he would have been even mentioned in a death roll when thousands probably of African American people were not. 
We don't know who died. We don't know who died on many marginalized people. And then, of course, Ida Barnett goes on to marry Mr. Wells, and we know her as Ida Barnett Wells. And um, the, the story of her devotion to her family is a devotion that is repeated across the state but I think it is even more significant to keep in mind that many people, particularly many African-American people, did not have recourse to, to any kind of resources. And let me go back and remind you that the Chambers, the John Chambers, was a ship coming down, a boat coming down with provisional aid. And the Chambers would dock after... As, as the chambers would come down the Mississippi River, it would dock at these various ports and it would be announced, hey, there's ice on the boat. Uh, lemons were a big thing. They thought lemon juice uh, was a uh, cure and a help for um, yellow fever. Coffins, there was a shortage of coffins. There was clothes, there was shoes, there was dried meat. There was anything that anybody might not have been able to get a hold of because of quarantine lines. And there actually were people who had sharecroppers working on their places as we moved into the fall and the chambers is coming down, who literally printed in papers, particularly around the Vicksburg area, there are some very good documents available, that no, the people from my place will not be allowed to get any of those supplies. I will take care of this. A very, very interesting incident as a result of that attitude uh, occurred in uh, Vicksburg, and it was the creation by African Americans named the Peabody Association. And there was a counterpart in New Orleans, and this was African American people literally creating their own self help organization to help them get through this epidemic because help was not coming to them. So this was something that occurred. Um, as we go through and look then at the, let me switch here. Um, we look at the map. We can find that um, at the end of the epidemic, Vicksburg, Holly Springs was just wiped out, called the, the City of Flowers. They thought they were safe because they were at a higher elevation. Good air, no bad air. Uh, Meridian, over here along the line, was terribly, terribly hit. Grenada was terribly, terribly hit. Let's see, do I see Grenada on this map? But Grenada would have been uh, north of Jackson in this area, north of Itala County. It was hit. Jackson actually recorded the last official case in the end of November. However, along the coast of Mississippi, there was a case uh, as late as December that might be a little dubious if it actually was yellow fever. But throughout the summer months, trade along these lines came to a standstill. Cities, the little tiny city of Lake Mississippi, if any of you have ever been there, the cemetery, you can go to Lake Mississippi, and there is probably every other stone it says died of yellow fever. That little city was just almost obliterated because Newton on this line had problems, Meridian had great problems, and the cities that received the greatest amount of aid was Vicksburg, Meridian, and Grenada. Uh, because they were so hard hit. And we know that yellow fever came there because of the railroad connection, bringing people who were fleeing the pestilence, trying to find a safe refuge, and just simply didn't know that they were carrying it with them wherever they go. Um, we find that the caseload, the numbers, of course, are uh, they can differentiate, but these are pretty good averages that I gave you. And the result of the yellow fever epidemic 
after going through and bearing from July until the end of November this horrific disease and this idea that you have no idea who's going to catch it, how it's going to be caught, um, the Mississippi legislature met and the Mississippi legislature and the federal government began addressing the disease of yellow fever. So in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes became president of the United States, and in September of 78, the Yellow Fever National Relief Commission was created um, at the direction of the federal government because there was so much suffering in the South. And still not knowing the source of the disease or the therapeutics for the disease, Again, that commission collected a lot of good data for we historians to look at, but th the best thing that they could do was come up with the idea of stricter quarantines. And quarantine stations were looked at, quarantine stations were explored. So the federal government is trying to deal with this in 1877. The Mississippi State Board of Health there is still not the money. Um, we looked at the loss for the railroads. I reported that about 40 million was lost in Mississippi, and that's just a nice round number they came up with in revenue. That would have been cost of just doing business, ladies and gentlemen. The cotton crop that was so important to the economics, in, just to show you what happened in 1877, or in 1878, excuse me, in 1877, there had been 803,000 bales of cotton that were taken to market. 1877, 78, during the epidemic, that dropped to 725. The very following year, when the epidemic ended, 1879, it popped up to 963,000. So the cash crop that cotton, and of course trying to get the cotton out of the fields at the height of the epidemic in September and October when cotton is harvested, and what labor are you going to have? You know, it, it, that is what created this problem. So many people found themselves in economically dire straits as a result of this. Businesses went out of business because they simply didn't have the produce and they didn't have the things to sell, even with donations coming into Mississippi, where were you going to spend it and how were you going to get to the nearest point to spend the money? Uh, public health in Mississippi um, will be a long time coming. Epidemics will continue in the state. It will not be until 1905 when the last official epidemic is in the state of Mississippi, and that was because there had been an international convention in Havana, Cuba, that had worked at Los Animas Hospital and had linked mosquitoes to the yellow fever and as the vector, even though in 1840s Josiah Knott out of Mobile had mentioned it, and he was laughed off of almost out of his profession, that how could that happen? So yellow fever in 1878 had a tremendous toll on the state of Mississippi. Politically, it secured some of the Democratic agenda. Uh, Republicanism at that point, because of the epidemic, was not only on the waning side, but just about disappeared because of the epidemic. Economically, Mississippi was hurt, and it had already suffered so much economic hardship that it just absolutely devastated the economy in 78. And then health-wise, we just simply didn't get, because again, the science had not put two and two together with the mosquito and with the disease. That would come later. So it was very dire times in 1878 Mississippi during this 1878 yellow fever epidemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deanne. We have several questions. 
that have come in. Let me scroll back to the first one here. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to paraphrase it since I remember it. Nikki Matson had, had asked about the camphor in shoes and whether that was thought to ward off yellow fever in some way. It was. They thought that it would ward off yellow fever. Um, if, if you wore it around your neck, like, uh, like a poultice, they would kind of put things together and put it around your neck, and we've seen that with other diseases. Um, they believed that if you sprinkled carbolic acid everywhere, that that would cure yellow fever because remember they're struggling with how it's, how do you catch it? There was some idea that there was little things, little fomites that you could touch and maybe pick it up. Um, or you could have breathed bad air. There was even one doctor who swore rotting oysters caused yellow fever. <laughs> uh, so we can imagine the smell there. But any kind of therapeutic that might have yielded some kind of success, I'm sure was latched onto. Um, you know, mail was fumigated trying to think that if there's the fomites on the mail, that it was fumigated. Um, they actually had quarantine stations that, uh, where you had to sit on the ship for several weeks until there was no yellow fever. So anything they tried, yes, they thought it would help. Diane Williams asks, can you speak on the yellow fever devastating Rocky Springs, Mississippi? And it, do you know of other cities that were destroyed by the fever? Well, Rocky Springs was just devastated, yes. Um, probably the nearest one that I would associate Rocky Springs with very close to here, I would say, would be Lake. Mm -hmm. Lake took a very long time to uh, repopulate. And in fact, when I was doing research and I went to Lake, there actually was still a home there that was referred to as the Pest House. And you see that in Vicksburg and also in Holly Springs, where they would actually take people with. Um, so there were many mu small municipalities across the state that were devastated by yellow fever. Sarah Campbell asks, how were quarantine lines established? Were these unofficial? They were unofficial and somewhat official. And I mean this. Cities, because in 1877 you were allowed by the state legislature as a county to create your own county board of health, that was often ineffective. And it was up to the county board of health through the direction of Wart Johnson, you know, you really need to start thinking about quarantine. Well, it wasn't you must you have to, you really need to start thinking about it. So oftentimes municipalities themselves would set up quarantines just upon an arbitrary linear basis around their city. One successful city in 1878, um, my Mississippians out there, I've never mentioned Natchez. Natchez had an effective quarantine in 1877, or 78, excuse me, ineffective in 1853, but effective in 1878. Uh, shotguns often were the um, determining factor whether you were leaving the city or coming into the city. So this was the problem with quarantines and that's such a good question. You not only kept people out, but you kept people in, which means that you've got no commerce going on and you've got like that poor old psycho woman who couldn't have any money and where are you going to do and what are you going to eat? So they were supposed to be a little more official than what they were, yes. <laughs> you may have answered Jim Woodrick's question. He wants me to start out with a compliment to you for the excellent presentation. Uh, and then asks, Natchez, as I understand it, suffered few deaths during the yellow fever epidemic. Is there any speculation about why Natchez fared so well compared to other locales? Natchez had many quarantine shotgun guards. Yes, Mississippi College delayed its opening. Uh, first, it did, and I'm saying that since we're here in Jackson, it opened, um, it was supposed to open in uh, September, then it was going to be October, then it finally opened in November. Ole Miss did the same thing. 
Mississippi State was literally opening as a university, and it had to delay it. Um, Sunday schools stopped meeting. All schools came to a halt. Uh, seminaries came to a halt. Meetings of any kind came to a halt. So the educational process, and that would be a wonderful also book to write, but the educational process that was going on, and keep in mind, Mississippi did not have public schools, so you had such a, a dearth of educational opportunities to begin with, then this epidemic comes along and we've got even greater problems. So it even affected the major universities. Uh, ben Moore asks, what medical attention was available for people at quarantine stations? Did people recover or just go there to die? Both. Oftentimes there was a medical officer at quarantine stations, um, but the medical officer had only the medical knowledge and tools of the time to work with the epidemic. So the quarantine stations often would stop, um, and I cannot imagine, if, I mean, I think in Jackson and on the coast today, I know we're mid-90s to upper 90s. And just imagine in Mississippi in 1878, put yourself in the clothes of the time, and you're on board a ship, and you're being quarantined, and you're anchored somewhere. I can only imagine the human suffering of just that process. Richard Buckholtz asks, were there people who refused to take protective measures? Yes. There were several people and incidents that I have run across, and protective measures would have been staying behind the quarantine lines at the time, that were caught, and the newspapers just absolutely talked about this person as the lowest person to walk the earth to have tried to jump the quarantine lines. Now, I'm sure that um, there's a wonderful story about a family, um, the Griffith family down in the Pascagoula area, who were from this area, the Jackson area. And um, the, the, the Mr. Griffith was concerned about a cousin, so you had to write a letter and get a pass. And there's a wonderful family story about giving the letter and the pass to a um, person who worked for them and how he had to skirt between Clinton and here and hold the letter up all the time in the past so he wouldn't get shot as he was trying to go from the Jackson area to the Clinton area. The same gentleman had a question uh, if survivors developed an immunity to yellow fever. Yes and no. And that is a really, really great question. There were many people, I had mentioned earlier in the talk, the 1853 epidemic. And there were people who lived through the 1853 epidemic, and the term that is used for that is seasoned. That people who lived in the South often believed that because they had breathed the air, they had lived here in this uh, often insalubrious climate, as it was called, uh, that they had become seasoned, and particularly if they made it through 53. But as we know, virus are different, and they can change, and those who did, but there is evidence that yes, indeed, you do develop antibodies. One last question. Nancy Davis Ray asks, was there an effect from yellow fever on the town of Rodney? Yes. Rodney was greatly affected, as was Port Gibson. Uh, there's towns were absolutely affected by yellow fever. And because mostly of the lack of population and the lack of economic resources in this epidemic, many towns just had a very difficult time uh, recovering because we, we can think of the past stresses that they've had through the 60s and the 70s, and now at the end of the 70s, you've got this epidemic. So yes, very, very difficult times. One thing that I learned from this great book, which is again available, signed copies available in the Mississippi Museum store uh, with contact information in the comments of the live stream, 
you had mentioned that cannon were used uh, in a uh, quarantine line, but there was one other instance where cannon were fired in the book um, as a potential treatment. Was that one of the... A preventative measure. Yes. The, many people believe that the concussion in the air from firing the cannon and the smoke would actually dispel the miasma and so you could fire into the atmosphere and any bad uh, miasmic air carrying yellow fever would have been, you know, I guess destroyed or, you know, diluted enough. And then, of course, the smoke was the added bonus, too. As a native Mississippian, let me just note that that seems like the ultimate way to <laughs> address the issue. Yes. Thank you all for watching today. I hope that uh, you will tune back in next week when Josh Green will talk about the Jackson Country Club raid um, and come see Mississippi Distilled here in the museums. Come visit the museums. Dan, thank you so much for this. We're looking forward to your new book and we'll have you back when that's out. Thank you so much.